So we're, today we're going to talk about occupational and environmental hazards in dentistry. Please, this is my email. Anyone who has any questions, uh, you can send me an email. Uh, all the uh, reading uh, references are already uploaded to your uh, e-learning website. And I already checked yesterday to make sure that it is updated. So um, guidance on occupational hazards in dentistry published in 2016. I just want you from this article to look at laser and radiation in addition to biological and psychological hazards. Risk assessment in dentistry, the advice sheet by the British Dental Association. I want you to focus on the blue table at the end of this document. The environmental impact of dentistry published in 2007. It's a very nice article. I just want you to focus on the information related to mercury and silver. And finally, the occupational health problems in modern dentistry. 2007, I want you to focus on table one in addition to our information from this lecture. Okay. The aims and objectives of this talk is going to be to uh, identify hazards in dentistry and eliminate and minimize hazards. So when we say hazard, it means anything that can cause harm. Risk of hazard is the chance of being harmed by this hazard. Okay. In any occupational uh, environment, in any occupation, we need to go through steps that actually doesn't go in one direction. It, it goes in, around and around. So it's like a circle of events that we need to follow to be able to um, control, uh, prevent, maybe prevent or minimize those risks. So the first thing we need to do is to be able to identify hazards in my environment, in my working environment. Prioritize them, which is the most risky. I put it at the top followed by next and next and next, and then at the bottom is the least risk, the minimal risk. And then I need to determine how can I prevent or minimize or control this risk. So I need to determine the necessary controls. After that, I implement, I apply those controls, and then I evaluate the effectiveness of my methods that I use. Then I go back, maybe a few months later, and then I go back and evaluate prioritize risks again. I need to identify risks, maybe new risks are there, other risks have disappeared. I evaluate, prioritize, and go on and on with, my, with this circle to control the risks in my environment. Who's at risk in my environment as a dentist? Well, all dentists, of course, and this is the main dentist, the co-workers, also auxiliary dental workers like nurses, therapists, hygienists, technicians are also at risk. Um, service or maintenance personnel in your environment are at risk. And of course, the customers, the patients and everyone who comes with them are considered uh, individuals at risk from your environment. This table summarizes the uh, and classify the hazards that as a dentist you could be exposed to. And we will go through them in details. Physical hazard, chemical hazard, biological hazards, ergonomic hazards, and psychosocial hazards. We're going to start with the physical hazards. For example, cuts from clean sharp instruments. And clean is a very important word here because if the sharp instruments were used and contaminated by patients' blood or saliva, then this is not a physical hazard anymore. It's biological hazard. So here we're talking about you have a clean kit, you're trying to open it, and then you, you get an accident. You get cut from these sharp instruments. Fire, projectiles, physical injury if compressed gas cylinders are used, vibration and noise, exposure to UVA radiation when curing resin-based materials, burns from handling recently heat sterilized equipment, exposure to ionizing radiation when taking dental x-rays, exposure to laser beams during dental procedures, falling hazards associated with slips, trips, and falls. All these are considered physical hazards that you could be exposed to in your environment as a dentist. So we will come to cuts from sharp instruments like medical uh, instruments and scissors, blades maybe, um, ropes, so to be able to avoid and minimize and prevent such accidents, 
you need to avoid to use sharps if possible. So for example, if you are trying to use to open a kit, it's important not to keep all instruments in one kit because sometimes you open it, you are not intending to use sharp instrument, but by accident, because everything is there in the kit, you get uh, a cut or uh, an accident with a sharp instrument. So it's important to keep them aside, separate. The base sharps with safety engineered medical devices, of course, proper storage of sharps, worker education is important for you, your co-workers, your nurses, everyone that works around you. Safe work procedures should be followed. If an accident happened, then you need to follow the standard measures according to the size of the cut, etc. Fire projectiles or physical injury if compressed gas cylinders dropped, mishandled or damaged. How to prevent and avoid such type of an accident? Install protective valve caps when cylinder is not in use. Secure and restrain cylinders, usually at one of the corners away from the co-workers. Safe work procedures that include use, care maintaining, storage and transport. Of course, worker training is important. Personal protective equipment based on hazard assessment and type of compressed gas. Protective footwear for those who are going to handle such large cylinders. They should use protective footwear. Vibration or noise, when you are used as a dentist, of course, you use scalers, high-speed surgical suctions, rotary instruments, high-speed handbees, low-speed handbees. All these instruments and tools will, will produce noise and vibration. Now, according to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, up to eight hours of being exposed to a noise of 85 decibels is considered okay. This is okay. Above this level, you will have a higher risk of developing noise induced hearing loss. So this is a problem because as a dentist, you almost always use such instruments and tools from one patient to the other. You know, when you have like a busy schedule, you will be exposed to lots of this, uh, of these levels of noise and vibration. Um, what should you do? You can replace your Sorry, you can replace your uh, chair, your instruments with more advanced uh, uh, instruments. And usually the more uh, advanced uh, instruments will have better technologies, less vibration, less noise, and it will be more healthy if you have a, a busy clinic. Uh, and try to schedule patients who need scaling uh, far away from each other. So one patient with scaling and maybe two, three patients, uh, maybe simple fillings, simple uh, procedures, impressions, for example, and then another patient for scaling and so on and so forth. Don't schedule them uh, after each other so just to have a rest for your hearing. Exposure to UVA radiation when curing resin based materials. Uh, to prevent and avoid such accidents, it's important to maintain your equipment. Design the area so that the least people are being exposed because this is not a risk for you only as a dentist. It's the patient that you're treating, whoever who's accompanying your patient and sitting around, your nurse, your co-workers could be exposed as well. Blue light filters that are used immediately with the light cure like this one here. Workers education, safe work procedures and eye protective UV filters that you can use for you, your patients and the nurse and uh, people surrounding you during the procedure. Burns from handling recently heat sterilized equipment. Uh, it's, this is not a joke, it's, it's actually um, uh, something that could happen. It's real because if you have a very busy clinic and very limited number of kits and instruments, then you need to have a very fast turnover for your instruments to be sterilized. And sometimes the nurse will handle you the kit and it's still hot. It, it, it just it, it picked it up now from the sterilizer. So it's important to make sure that you book your patients in, in a proper way so that the turnover of the instruments is in a proper, uh, let's say, uh, number and rate. Uh, to prevent such a problem, you need to have work uh, process designed to manage equipment turnover. Safe work procedures should be followed. 
Exposure to laser beams and ionizing radiation when taking dental x-rays? Well, the risks could be genetic effects, reproductive effects, all the way to cancer. So this is, again, real risk. And the possible cause, of course, poor workplace design or lack of shielding, lack of filters. To avoid and prevent and minimize such risks, it's important to go for a proper work design to provide distance between worker and source. Uh, appropriate shielding materials should be used. Equipment design to minimize scatter. Audible signals on machines when exposure is ended, so something that you can actually hear, a beep or something. The placement of older dental x-rays equipment with the newer equipment that has usually additional safety features. Worker education, safe work procedures to reduce exposure time. Radiation safety program. Exposure monitoring, for example, like the badges that we can wear and then monitor every month or so to identify the amount of radiation that we are exposed to during our work. Lead gloves, aprons, etc., uh, things that we could use to protect ourselves and protect our patients. Physical hazards, again, uh, falling hazards associated with slips, trips, and falls. Slips, trips, and falls. Uh, this is part of our environment, and in order to minimize this, we need to install slip resistance flooring. Ensure, uh, sorry, design stairwell, uh, stairwells according to accepted safety standards. Ensure adequate lighting, this is important. Perform regular maintenance on flooring, stairwells, hallways, handrails, everything in, the, in, in your environment. Implement a spill cleanup program. A spill cleanup program um, that includes prompt spill cleanup use of warning signs, etc. So it's an immediate dealing with this problem. And appropriate footwear with gripping soles and good support for you and your team. So this is finishing the physical hazards, and now we're gonna we're gonna talk about chemical hazards. Like as a dentist, you could be exposed to beryllium, formaldehyde, methylmethacrylate. Uh, metals and silica, mercury and latex, maybe other materials, but these are the most commonly. Uh, you can be affected as a dentist with them. Brilliant, for example, uh, could you could inhale such a material when you are working with items like dental crowns, bridges, partial dentures, and inhaling such material could be associated with chronic perilium disease that goes scarring to the lung tissues. Exposure to disinfecting materials or cleaning agents like formaldehyde actually could be associated with severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and eye irritation. Methylmethacrylate is used as a filler, and its exposure can cause contact, dermatitis, occupational asthma, drowsiness, headache, anorexia, localized distal sensory neuropathy. So in general, these materials, how can I minimize uh, exposure and prevent such risk? If possible, avoid using them at all. Use a proper substitute. Maintain adequate general ventilation and enclosed mixing devices to avoid and minimize production of vapor. Develop safe work procedures, of course, the same. Educate workers of the nature of the hazard, medical monitoring, Gloves, eye protection, and face shields should be used. Now, here, metals and silica are uh, used as fillers in different dental materials, for example, glass enamel cement, compomers, composites, impression materials, some adhesive systems might include metals and silica. And uh, this might cause serious lung disease, sometimes cancer, and maybe death. So again, this is a serious risk. In order to avoid such a problem, minimize it maybe, again, avoid using those materials if possible. Use more safe substitution, if available. If you're gonna use them, then maintain adequate general ventilation of the working environment, enclosed mixing devices, with mopping where silica is present, if silica was dropped or present, 
and you want to get rid of the excess, it's important to go for wet cleaning, not dry. Dry cleaning will lead to dust and then you, you, you might inhale such materials. So it's important to go for wet mopping. Of course, educate the workers about the nature of the hazards, medical monitoring, gloves, eye protection, face shields, etc. Mercury, 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 and amalgam. This is um, a, a big dilemma, uh, I think, in, in the restorative field. Um, exposure to such a material could be directly through contact of the skin or inhalation of the mercury vapor. Inhalation is considered the primary route of exposure, and about 80% of inhaled mercury will be absorbed through the lung. The vapor pressure of mercury will increase rapidly with temperature. So let's imagine that you're using your high-speed handbees, you're trying to drill an old amalgam, it will produce heat temperature. This will actually increase the vapor pressure of mercury and increase risk of inhalation. It has been reported that the effects of mercury poisoning are generally not neurologically measurable until the urinary mercury level reaches 500 micrograms per liter. Usually mercury will accumulate after it's being absorbed in the lung. It will accumulate later on in kidneys, liver, brain, and heart. Mainly the highest concentration uh, are in kidneys and liver. Exposure to mercury can carry number of health risks ranging from very minimal loss of appetite, nausea, diarrhea, all the way to birth defects and offsprings. So this is ranging in severity of the uh, health risk. So we can have depression, fatigue, increased irritability, sensitivity to such material, insomnia, and this means uh, lack of sleep, swollen glands and tongue, ulceration of the oral mucosa, nephritis, tremor that eventually progressed to convulsions, pneumonitis, birth defects, as we said, in offspring. How can I avoid being exposed to mercury? Well, again, if you don't need to use it, use a substitution. So as much as possible, try to avoid using it at all. And that is usually amalgam because amalgam contains mercury. If you're going to use it, you need to maintain adequate general ventilation in addition to uh, exhaust ventilation, local ventilation when removing old amalgam. This is an exhaust local ventilation or high speed uh, surgical uh, suction, especially when you are trying to remove old amalgam and you're having your hand beast uh, drilling the old amalgam, heat, more vapors. It's important to have, in addition to the general ventilation, you need to have local exhaust ventilation when removing such old amalgams. And of course, the usual safe work procedures, workers' education, store product according to manufacturer's instructions, protective clothing, gloves, eye protection, and respiratory protection, monitor work environment following a spill. So if you have a spill, uh, including, uh, including the material, the mercury, then it's important to uh, follow immediate cleanup. Uh, you can use wash bottle trap, connected to low volume aspirator for with your dental unit. Uh, if you're having visible droplets of mercury, you can use handheld bumps like this one here, handheld bumps, aspirator bulbs or plastic syringes. Of course, using sponges are not indicated. Dry or wet mopping is not indicated. Household vacuum is not indicated at all. Brooms and stuff that you need to clean are not indicated. Once you collect your mercury, never pour it down the drain. You need to collect it in a certain sealed container and then you can dispose it with uh, proper, following proper instructions. Okay. Nowadays we have commercially available spill cleanup kits and sometimes it contains uh, powdered sulfur. Powdered sulfur is yellow in color. When it binds to mercury, it will turn to brown. So if you have droplets of mercury that are not visible, then you can actually use this powder and then it will change its color, as we said, and make the mercury visible. It's easier to know where the spell is. And 
it will make cleaning easier and it will reduce the amount of vapor of mercury because it will absorb it. So this is one of the materials that could be used in during the spill cleanup using spill cleanup kit. Another chemical hazard and that is latex. Uh, latex could be part of the latex gloves or components of medical devices like the uh, uh, rubber dam or any other materials that we could use in, in the test tree. Now, if you are exposed to rubber latex, uh, the natural rubber latex, you can have reactions ranging from simple irritation all the way to immediate hypersensitivity reaction. Irritation, which is a non-allergic condition, you can see irritated skin, dry, crusty, and symptoms will resolve as soon as you stop contact with the latex. Um, another type of reaction that is the delayed hypersensitivity, and usually this uh, happens uh, 6 to 8, 48 hours after contact with latex. And you can see it as, again, skin is dry, but crusty, leathery, sometimes eruptions and blisters could be visible. The last severe reaction is the immediate hypersensitivity reaction. This is anaphylactic symptoms, and this is serious. It will appear as skin hives. It can migrate beyond the point of contact. So the point of contact will be affected and it will spread beyond that contact point. Uh, you can have systemic allergic symptoms such as itching eye, swelling of lips and tongue, breathlessness, difficulty of breathing, dizziness, abdominal pain, nausea, hypotension, shock, and maybe death if there is no proper treatment and, inter and intervention. How to avoid such problems? Well, you need to, again, if you uh, have any problem with latex, avoid using any medical equipment or gloves that contain latex. You can use powder-free and hypoallergic latex gloves. Use more safe substitutes. Maintain adequate general ventilation. Purchasing controls to limit latex containing materials from entering the facility, especially if you or one of your coworkers or nurses are having this problem, you can educate the workers in the nature of the hazard, hand washing after glove removal, proper glove donning and removal. Regarding the silver, its source and its effect to the environment uh, in dentistry, please refer to this article that is available for you in your website. Now we will come to another type of hazard and that is the biological hazards. As a dentist, you can be exposed to a number of microorganisms that comes from patient saliva or blood, such as viruses and bacteria, viruses like COVID-19, hepatitis B and C, herpes simplex, bacteria like the mycobacterium, tuberculosis. And what could be this source? Where can this come from? Well, it, you, can, you can be exposed to blood and saliva directly contacting uh, your, um, you know, an, uh, a new wound, your eye maybe, contaminating a needle or sharp instrument, exposure to respiratory infectious diseases through droplets or airborne transmission. Droplets producing from flutters from body fluid, projectiles while using high-speed devices, um, exposure to environmental ventilation, biological contaminants from systems, water, or food. So all these are sources of exposure to those biological hazards. And here we come to a very important injury, and that is the inoculation injuries. Inoculation injuries are all incidents where contaminated object or substance breaches the integrity of your skin or mucous membrane, or comes into contact with the eye. So this biological agent can come into your body through your skin or mucous membrane or through your eye. Your eye becomes contaminated and it will go through the, to your body through this entrance. Example of inoculation injuries are sticking or stabbing with used needle. So if the, if the needle or the sharp instrument is still uh, not used, then this is not biological hazard, it is physical hazard. But once it's contaminated, it is biological hazards and we call it inoculation injuries. Maybe splashes with contaminated substances that comes to your eye or other open lesions, cuts, 
with contaminated equipment, bites or scratches inflicted by your patient. So as you can see here, the diseases transmission rates after needle injury, mainly hepatitis C, followed by hepatitis B, and less common HIV uh, uh, disease. It is estimated that there are around 100,000 uh, sharp injuries in UK each year. 56% chance that dental practitioner will receive needle stick injury each year. So this is a lot. This is a high percentage of risk. Now, inoculation injuries must be dealt with promptly. If you are exposed to inoculation injuries, then it's important to bleed it, wash it, cover it, report it. So this is what you need to do if you have any inoculation injuries. Report it, it's important to keep a record of patient's information in details, how the accident happened, when the accident happened, and the risk of exposure to any of the biological agents we talked about. If uh, the uh, injury is deep and the transmission is through the skin by a needle stick or a puncture, a wound, or by contaminated cut, or if the penetrating injury is by a device visibly contaminated with blood, or you've been injured with a needle that had been used directly in the source patient's artery or vein, or exposure to a source patient that is at the end of the HIV infection stages. If this happened to you from the patients that has an HIV positive, then it's important to uh, use antiretroviral drugs and usually this should happen within hours, uh, ideally within one hour after the exposure. So although HIV is less common, but if, it's, if there is a risk, it's important to act immediately. So this table here, I want you to focus on what to do and when to act for HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Okay. How to avoid biological hazards if possible? Well, you need to obtain, of course, medical history of patients, complete records so that if any accident happens, then you know exactly what to deal, what to do and what, and, and what you're dealing with. Equipment to minimize uh, formation of aerosols, like using rubber dams to uh, avoid splatters and aerosols and a uh, large amount of saliva. High speed evacuation. Proper disinfection of instruments and decontamination of environmental surfaces. Lab supplies and materials. Vaccines for an immunization program for you and every co-worker uh, that is uh, working with you in your environment, proper work area design and ventilation. In addition, you have to have proper disposal of waste materials, workers' education, of course, the use of personal protective equipment like gloves, um, eye and face protection when splashers and splatters are possible, like face shield, gowns or uniforms that should be changed daily or when contaminated, availability of sharp containers for disposal, these are the sharp containers, and usually you need to have this in every clinic. Sharp containers, you don't dispose your sharps in any bin. Uh, you need to have a special sharp containers. No recapping of needles, even if multiple injections are used in the same patient. Never, do not recap your needles. Do not recap your needles. You can use the one hand scoop technique, but you need to be very careful. Don't use both hands. OK, don't use both hands. This is important, especially for uh, beginners dentists. Uh, so you give the patient the first injection, you put it on the tray, you're busy with something else, and then you want to handle it again, you'll be injured. You try to cover it, you'll be injured if you're not focused. So it's important to avoid recapping your needles. Uh, the fourth, I think this is the fourth uh, type of hazard after the physical, chemical, and biological, and this is the ergonomic hazards. Uh, and uh, this is a physical factor within the environment that harms the musculoskeletal system. As dentists, you are exposed to repetitive movement, manual handling, uncomfortable workstation height, poor body positioning, seated working postures, 
repeated undirectional twisting of the trunk, working in one position for prolonged periods. And I think this is what you're doing right now with the phantom hip that you're working with, right? You're trying to practice the proper sitting and handling and viewing of different quadrants. So the upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left quadrants should have different seating positions in order to protect yourself protect your musculoskeletal system. So in the future, when you have a busy clinic, this is a prolonged period of time where you're twisting your, your trunk and you're, you, you have a, a prolonged working postures that is not healthy. This table you can use. Uh, I think I already provided this for you with one of the references, I hope. And it just gives you uh, the problems as a dentist you could be faced with what are the causes and what are the recommendations to avoid such problems? Carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the ergonomic problems in dentistry and it is caused by continual repetitive movements. So this is typical dental work. And it is a painful condition of the hand and fingers caused by compression of major nerve, this nerve, median nerve, that passes over the carpal bones through a passage at the front of the wrist. So if this gets stressed and pressed down, it will cause the carpal tunnel syndrome. Potential psychological hazards, and there is a long list. As any working environment, we are exposed to stresses um, uh, caused by running behind schedule, causing pain to the patient. This is a source of stress. We are dentists, patient will come in pain or we're gonna cause the pain during our procedure. This is a source of stress. Heavy workload, late and anxious patients, of course our patients, uh, most of them are anxious patients. So this is a source of stress for us. What will happen is um, we'll be exposed to a number of psychological hazards like depression and anxiety, sleep disorders, other mental illnesses, uh, as a response to excessive workplace stressors. Abuse by clients, members of the public or co-workers, hazards related to working alone, sometimes techno stress related problems, um, and that is related to uh, worrying about uh, not being up to date in terms of technology, especially nowadays. You can have uh, new materials and new techniques and new instruments every now and then, and you need to be up to date with these instruments and materials. So this is the techno stress source of problems. Hazards related to impacts of aging, exposure to noises, of course, and irritation. So this is, doesn't only affect your hearing, it will affect your, it is source of stress. It will induce stress. Exposure to poor indoor air quality that may induce stress, job burnout. And now if this is common, more people are aware of it. Job burnout is a state of physical or emotional exhaustion. You are exhausted from your, from your occupation or from your working area. It also involves a sense of reduced accomplishments and loss of personal identity. So every now and, ten, and then you need to pull yourself out of your environment, have a break and then go back so that to avoid job burnout. So to prevent such problems, psychosocial problems, you need to have programs to maintain or build resilience or coping skills. Of course, communication with family physician could be helpful. Management policies and procedures related to no tolerance of violence or abuse in your working environment whatsoever. Well-trained security guards are important, especially if you're working in a big building, working alone. You need to have an escort services to parking lots to keep you safe. Working alone policies and using name tags ability to request support and use of counseling services, self-education concerning new technologies to cope with technologies and avoid techno stress uh, source of problems. Time management strategies are important to avoid the uh, high load uh, pressure in your environment, in your clinic. Healthy lifestyles, of course, uh, applied by you. Setting realistic goals are also important to avoid such sources of hazards and stress. So this is just a general overview of the most important hazards as uh, you are exposed to as a dentist. 